Mandy for being the background of all of this. And thanks to every one of you for attending. Uh, the trouble is we tend to forget that the world goes on. We tend to forget that dependent on alcohol and smoking lockdowns, the reality is people still injure themselves. They still fall out of buildings. Uh, they still beat each other up. And uh, the sale of pineapples, I think, as everyone is aware, has rocketed. So the best made plans work some of the time. South Africans are very good at making up things as they go along. And I thought, it's six o'clock at night, you've had a long day. I thought what I would do is try and keep this a little lighter, a shorter talk, and there is some, but not a huge amount of science, but really just talking about what we're doing um, at Mill Park, which for those of you who aren't fully aware, is a private hospital in one of the hospital groups, NetCare. But uh, the trauma center is relatively unique in that it has full satellite status with Wits University. And we all carry hospital appointments uh, through the university as well. So that means we are responsible for the quality of care that goes on. This was said right at the beginning. It's not like the, it feels as if the government's just decided on its own, but there have been some very, very good brains on that medical advisory council. The river fills as you cross, and sometimes you slip. Sometimes you say, well, what did you do that for? Why did you do that? Why do you buy sheets and not towels? And they change and they amend. And we know just like everything else, there comes a honeymoon period where people say they're doing the right thing. Then there's increasing muttering. But when they look back on what's happened in South Africa, things are not as bad as they seem. There are upsides and downsides. Public gatherings are limited, not always at the most appropriate wedding chapel. Public spacing is observed, but not always at funerals and not always at large gatherings and not only at family gatherings. And that is the general response of doctors to COVID. Oh my gosh, we're all going to die from this disease. Actually, it's about somewhere between one and a half and five percent, depending on where you are. Like a rabbit caught in the headlights. But part of that, as always, is a complete lack of full depth of understanding as to what is happening and a lack of knowing what to do next. Now, it's very easy if you can go to a textbook. There's no textbook on COVID. I think the one thing that we've learned from COVID is firstly, it's like a computer screen. You write something on it, don't like it, delete it and write something else. And then the whole system crashes and everything that you thought was working, you've got to start from the beginning again. No wonder that is looking a little terrified because we as doctors have been blundering around and not just doctors, but epidemiologists, healthcare workers of every description saying, well, we don't actually know what to do next. So this is the reality. The first official case in South Africa happened around uh, the uh, 10th to 12th of March. And by 27th of March, hard lockdown began. I think one of the big faults that we have learned uh, that, we, that the, the lay public doesn't understand is lockdown will not change the total number of cases that a country gets. Lockdown delays the onset to allow better preparation. Now, some countries are better organized. Some countries have better facilities. We have a wide spectrum in what is a developing country, and we needed all the time that we could have. In retrospect, the Western Cape was hardest hit, possibly because uh, the tourists brought it in long before we really knew about the, the extent of the disease. Nonetheless, until the lockdown happened, we had very few cases. We had a rapid lockdown, one of the harshest and one of the earliest in the world. And you know what? It actually has paid off. If you look at the daily infection increases and the benchmark is the first 100, New Zealand is on its own, except that they've now had a, a significant number and have gone into a second lockdown. And you can see where South Africa is uh, somewhere below the top four or five, United States, for obvious reasons, is leading the pack. But 
if you have a look at this graph, you can actually see how when that lockdown happened, our graph changed dramatically. And whereas almost every country within 40 days of, um, of onset had reached their biggest top of their curve, we never reached the top of the curve. We've had a gradual increase, but now more recently, as you can see, we're leveling off. So that's the good news. The global picture is we are currently fifth in the world after the United States, Brazil, India, Russia, South America. And then the, the other prize holders are mainly North America and South America. Many have now got over their huge uh, rise, but several countries, particularly at the moment, uh, the European countries, France, Spain, and so on, are having a second exponential rise, and France is having two and a half thousand cases a day, which is more than South Africa is having at the moment. This is the situation as of yesterday. Gauteng had appro approximately 900 new cases, and we had a total of 3,600 odd over the 24 hours. France had 2,600 and it's rising and it will probably overtake us within the next three or four days. Um, the other thing that has been dramatic is we really are having a much reduced death rate from all causes compared to everybody else. And as most of you know, we're running at about an 80% recovery or having already recovered. And if you look at the curves, either daily confirmed cases, that's to an extent the reflection, and this is again uh, today's data, 16th of August, yesterday's data, you can see how pretty much daily cases, active cases, and daily deaths, which lag behind, are all in the decline in almost every province. What is known is that the uh, RT estimate which is the reproduction estimate. You can see when lockdown happened, we had, a, if a lockdown estimate is one, that means that the number of cases will stay static. Uh, anything more than that, you get a dramatic rise of cases. So you can see that around the time of lockdown, the number of cases reduced, but started rising again into April. And by the beginning of May, it had reached a constant to 1.22. You can't ease lockdown when you're at that sort of number. And there is a flexibility, as you can see on the graph, you can be, have highs and lows and so on. To put it into perspective, the UK at the moment is sitting at around 0 0.75. Look what's happening in South Africa. We're down to 0 0.46 and falling. As things stand, the number of cases is dropping, and that's a reflection also in the number of active cases that are falling. Daily cases, Gauteng had the biggest and shortest peak. In a sense, the Western Cape led the country for us. They had the first peak. They're still having a much flatter curve than the Gauteng is, and pretty much the same with the daily deaths. Gauteng is all of the, over the place, but the deaths are falling. So there are the daily new cases up to the 16th. And I think it's pretty clear across the board, South Africa is falling. And this is the bottom line. When are we going to learn to use masks? And this is a picture that's used in kids' education, hence the comment on the bottom. No masks, you spray at each other. One mask, you get a one-sided spray. Two masks, you have a sum, and you notice that there's still a little bit of fog there, but you have some spread, but not a huge level of spread. And I think one of the things that has been very visible in public South Africa has been the wearing of masks. Not all masks are suitable. Our politicians have a particular ability to inhale and exhale through their necks, at least that's where their masks are. But that's not limited to South Africa. Uh, there's a certain president in North America who uses masks when needed. Um, there are some problems. Joggers prefer not to wear masks, which is uh, fine if the pedestrian walking on the side of the road or the cyclist passing 
by has not spread droplets. But if you're walking at the side of the road and you haven't got your mask on, if a cyclist comes past you breathing hard, those uh, microparticles are going to be with you. So South Africa's been pretty good. And I think that more than anything else, and we don't know what happens in private, we don't know what happens in six to 10 occupants per single room in a dwelling in downtown Johannesburg. But we do know that if you go out onto the streets, most people are wearing masks. In the UK, they're still thinking about, should we legislate for that? So let's move on to the hospital. Mill Park's one of the biggest private hospitals in Johannesburg. It's got 456, but can go up to about 500 beds with surge capacity. It's got 166 ICU stroke high care beds, 117 of full ICU. And of that 166, trauma has 50 ICU beds. One of the things that you can do to restrict, and we'll talk a little bit about staff protection, but one of the things that you can do to restrict uh, transmission is have negative pressure cubicles. And we're fortunate in that the building of our new uh, block has put in a significant number of that 166 beds, nearly 60 beds are negative pressure beds where um, everything is held in the cubicle. And, and that's made a big difference. The problem with most positive pressure ventilations is that uh, the virus is spread by the ventilation system outside of the cubicle. In a sense, that's also why high volume uh, nasal cannulae have a downside in that they can assist in spread of the virus unless the other people are well protected as well. To date, this is the situation with Mill Park. We have had a total of 149 staff, which is approximately 10% of our staff, go positive. It's not been, posi not been possible really to say how many are community acquired and how many are not. And we sadly have had three deaths out of our 1,500 odd staff. It has a couple of problems. Obviously, you are losing a lot of staff in quarantine and so on. Most of the staff who went positive were symptomatic, were put into quarantine. And so far as we can tell, outside of the COVID areas, the uh, staff have not had a mass or fall down. Fortunately, the uh, availability of PPEs and the, uh, the reason for using PPEs was done fairly early. And I'll talk about how we got doing that. We know that patient to patient communication is common. That's the problem in, in care homes. It's also a little bit more of a problem in areas where you have fit patients or fitter patients, such as rehabilitation centers. And then you've got staff to staff transmission. When you go to the tea room, people let their guard down. So we'll talk a little bit more about chest tubes. We'll talk about ventilators. We'll talk about the different sort of circuits, timing and uh, roots and so on. Well, the root of a tracheostomy is usually into the trachea, but how one does that is, is differently done. So these are the Mill Park stats to date. Um, I will give you the cumulative stats in a moment, but just to give you a comparison, remembering it's a 450 bed hospital from a month ago, two weeks ago, and today. So COVID positives in hospital started at about 100. We shut down routine surgery very early, and we also cut, tried to cut down any surgical techniques, for example, tracheostomies, for a little bit longer. The peak was 54 COVID patients in ICU, 55 at a time, with a further number in high care um, who perhaps needed ICU beds, but we were tight on beds, remembering that we still kept fully open for trauma, cardiothoracics, and cardiology. So there was a double demand on the beds. Patients who came in as PUIs, under investigation went through to either the ward or the intensive care unit. On those particular days, we had an average of 12 to 14 fully ventilated 
our record it was seven ECMOs going on at the same time and, and as of today that's now down to five and we've halved we now have ICU capacity to an extent where we're now able to open up for routine surgery Trauma ICU is the world's second largest intensive care unit. We have 30 ventilated beds with up to 24 ventilators going in trauma at any time. All but four of the cubicles are positive pressure and the cubicles are screened one from the other, but they are open in the front for access to the patient. So they're not truly really a cubicle, they're a surrounding. And the end result of that is it's theoretically very possible for uh, inhalation of droplets or contamination hand. And we monitored our nosocomial infections very carefully. One of the things that was clear early on is the vector for nosocomial infections is always the charts. Uh, nursing staff would take a blood pressure, write the blood pressure on the chart, the doctor would come and read the chart and write on the chart and then move to the next patient carrying nosocomial bugs on hands. So rigid enforcement with or without gloves, which are obviously mandatory, of spraying hands from the patient before you touch the chart. Writing on the chart, spraying hands before you do anything else spraying hands every single time you touch your cell phone. And then the other thing that we've had for a very long time, but we instituted and I'll come back to it, is we had a trauma manual, SOPs, and we developed very early on standing orders for a COVID manual, not just for trauma, but for all sections of the hospital. So if you wanted to know what to do, there was a printed uh, or electronically available manual where uh, staff could go and refer to it. And it not only extended to what you should do and what you should wear and everything else, it also extended to full protocols of how the patients should be treated. Pretty much 100% of trauma patients or COVID patients get the same protocol. I think one of the nicest compliments I've ever been paid for our unit I'm not trying to sell the unit much, but one of the compliments that was given to our unit is we don't have to phone to see who's on duty because you all treat the patient the same way. And that predictability, particularly traditionally, if you put two surgeons in a room, you have three opinions. And if you put two respiratory physician, physicians in a room, there's a possibility they will still be discussing it. So it's incredibly useful to have for your hospital and for your EMS service, a manual which says, guys, this is what we do want to do. If you want to depart from that, it's fine as long as you can justify it. We started off with regular meetings. The first thing that, was, that happened, and this was really in um, about the beginning of March or even late February, long before the state of disaster was declared, a joint operations committee was formed chaired by the hospital manager and the chief nursing manager with representation from all clinical and allied disciplines, including obviously um, physio and dietetics and infection control and pharmacy, but also security um, and administration. So there was regular meetings and we had a full regular meeting twice a week, which uh, involved everyone when the state of disaster was declared, that meeting became a virtual meeting and is happening to this day, except we've now dropped it to once a week because the, the routines are in place. The second thing is that no one individual can do any of this. So we've always had a trauma team, but we introduced COVID teams and a COVID team and we have, uh, I'll come to the number of patients we've seen, but the COVID, we have three COVID teams, teams A, B and C. Each one is headed by an intensive care or pulmonology specialist. In addition, there is a second physician on the team. In addition, there is an anesthesiologist on the team 
come the reasons for that. And one other doctor on that medical team. And they essentially do one day in three. Both trauma and COVID changes very rapidly. And all the patients are seen three times a day or more every single day. Morning round, an afternoon stroke, early evening round, somewhere in the region of about four to six o'clock, and a middle of the night round. Because one of the things that we've learned, like I've learned about COVID, is that a patient, if they start deteriorating, can be from normal oxygen saturations with a nasal cannula to on a ventilator heading for ECMO within six hours. It really is dramatic. The other thing that we had to get through is that there is no, there are no boundaries here. So if one got enough trauma patient, multidisciplinary patient who came positive in COVID, that did not mean that the COVID team took over the management. While the primary disease process was the primary disease process, the primary team looked after them. So the trauma team looked after trauma. If the patient started developing respiratory decompensation, then the COVID team took over and trauma looked after their bit, but the initiative came from the COVID team. Doing that, the boundaries were much clearer and there wasn't much duplication, but what there was was a much bigger team spirit than we expected. To date, we've treated 7,000 patient days of COVID. 65% uh, of the total patients in the group have been treated at our hospital. And we have the lowest mortality in the group, which is sitting somewhere around the 1% mark. We've also stayed wholly open with no restrictions to cardiothoracics, trauma, and uh, cardiac. And part of the reason for that is very early on, it was decided to ring fence certain ICUs for the normal diseases that happen all the time. Uh, Millpark gets about 80 major trauma patients. In uh, June, there were 56 of those came in by helicopter. And the same with cardiothoracics, a very large cardiothoracic transplant program. And the only way that was able to continue is they ring-fenced trauma ICU, cardiothoracic ICU, and certain other parts as non-COVID areas. And I'll talk more about how we admitted and, and so on. Uh, but I think the first key, we're well down the line, was having separate ICUs which did not knowingly admit COVID patients. And if they got a COVID patient, that patient was moved to a COVID area. The whole hospital was split into green, yellow, and red areas. Green areas were uh, those which were fully screened. Yellow areas are all ICUs. We started off with some of the green areas, uh, such as trauma became, uh, we did a PCR on admission, and that was a green area where there was relatively free access. But as we found, and I'll come back to that, how you screen COVID patients changed, that became a yellow area. And you just forget that as much as COVID is important, people die of other things, and therefore you have to protect against both. At the other end of the spectrum, as I said, up to 54 in ICU, the peak that we've had on ECMO so far has been seven, but we do have a capacity of 12. And we're now down to less than 50% occupancy of the ICUs. So we've got a significant increase in our ICU capacity. One of the things that we found was that, and over the four months we've admitted, uh, that, that that is really from uh, when lockdown happened until now, we've admitted about 300 major trauma patients, P1 patients. Uh, about 30% of them have come in by helicopter because as hospitals have both got overwhelmed and have had staff problems getting their staff going positive and being unable to accept patients, we've had an increased number of transfers from elsewhere, both COVID and other diseases. 
In trauma ICU, over the 300 admissions of trauma patients, many of whom have needed ventilation, as I said, we had 24 ventilations going, 25 went positive after admission. Policy has been that we have four negative pressure uh, cubicles within trauma, and they became trauma PUI cubicles as did the resuscitation area. So any patient who was admitted to the resuscitation area, and frankly, any patient who comes into a hospital is treated as patient under investigation. You can do that at two levels. That means that staff protection is at code yellow level throughout. And that's the biggest responsibility we all have. The second is that they are admitted to our four negative pressure cubicles, and that included the burns that we got in as well. We were able to have a turnaround time of PCR down to around hours, often between two and four hours, and that too in these patients, because they are the sickest of the sick, and it really is helpful to know where the most suitable area for them is likely to be. Burns patients should ideally be in a burns unit, but can't be because burns units should be positive. That's room for another discussion. But burns patients should be positive and isolated. And the sooner we can get, be sure that they are negative, the better. So we've had 25 patients who were admitted. Their initial PCR, uh, PCR was negative. And based on that, they were put into the trauma intensive care unit positive area. As I said, they're screened between patients, but they're not cubicled. But they were fully nursed. Now remember, these patients almost by definition were asymptomatic. Uh, so they were almost all nursed with full code yellow, zone yellow precautions. We'll come back to that in a second. And to the best of our knowledge, we have had no staff go positive from a patient, and we have had no patient-to-patient -patient transmissions that we are aware of within the trauma environment. Most of these patients were asymptomatic, and as I mentioned, one never has the dichotomy of are they COVID patients with trauma or are they trauma patients with COVID, and should you be rigid? Just to remind you, you are only negative. On your last test, there is a three day or so window. So your patient picking up in the community is well enough to get into a fight or get into a room. We've seen where are the patients coming from, where you would expect. Funerals, hands down the biggest. Second one is religious services, hands down the biggest. Thirdly, home. Now, home can be one room with six people in it. You can't isolate, but you can wear a mask. And that does give a considerable amount of protection. The reality is that every single patient who attends any hospital in the Republic of South Africa should be screened. And then, unless that screen is absolutely clear where the patient is likely to go home, that patient should be treated as a patient under investigation every single time. That means your precautions are already in place. That means you are protecting yourself as a healthcare worker in the emergency vehicle, in the helicopter. You are protecting with a decent mask, you're protecting against inhalation, and you are protecting against contamination. All yellow zones, you can't go to full PPE. To be honest, they just are not the resources, and they're not the resources in first world countries. So these two young ladies are two of our nursing staff. They're wearing scrub suits underneath that. They have the gown, they have gloves, they have a mask, and they have a visor, and they have an apron on top. And that is what they wear for patients. If they come out, they take off their gloves, they take off their apron. That mask is over the N95 very often. So 
provided you protect the roots of ingress, which is eyes, nose, and mouth, provided you don't cough forwards, and provided you're aware of contamination, gloves, and what you're seeing there is easier to work in in a yellow zone. Now, this is very different from a full red zone, but in a yellow zone, most, if not all, of your patients at any time are going to be COVID negative. So you watch for the signs. You watch to try not to transmit to yourself, from yourself, or between patients. When you get into a COVID zone, one of the things that we've learned is the biggest enemy is fatigue. And really, nobody should be as dressed as in a COVID, if you saw pictures and discussions overseas, six to eight hours in a COVID zone is so exhausting with the personal protection that staff make mistakes. And it's absolutely key to keep your staff as fresh as you can. It's not always possible. Foot gear, we have not got enough funding to provide foot protection for everyone. And as a result of that, uh, either one keeps a set of shoes for work or when you go home, leave your shoes outside. COVID patients who are flown into Mill Park Hospital, uh, every helicopter is treated as if the patient is, an, is a PUI and they're wrapped up and so on. But if COVID patients are transferred in, and we do have a number of transfers, as I mentioned, from smaller hospitals, which are symptomatic as often as nothing else, when the helicopter has landed, the helicopter itself is then zapped with the, infra the ultraviolet light robot. And the, 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 the whole aircraft is cleaned. We do it on the pad. It's faster. It means we can turn around because there's a zapper ready for them all the time. So we can turn a helicopter around ready for its next flight far earlier than one would expect to be able to do. Every yellow zone and red zone has DON and DOF stations. 24 hours a day, the DON station is only for DONning. And there is a member of staff to assist, issue kit, and watch how people don their equipment. There's don training, you get a don license, but the reality is you're, you've always got a learner's license in this and there is always somebody watching you. And it doesn't matter how often. There's a downside to this, you've got to be very careful to say, oh God, this is just such an effort. I will not see my patients or I will do a ward round from the desk doesn't work. All acute care uh, should be provided with anesthesiologists as part of each team. The most dangerous part of dealing with a COVID patient is intubation and extubation. And in our protocols, and they're seen here and are available if anybody wants them, uh, we can, if you work through um, the team at Netcare, we can arrange for these to be sent to you. Um, the, the protocols laid down, they, as I say, they lay how you intubate. We found the box to be very cumbersome. We use the CMAC video laryngoscopy, but not everybody has that. We have the Draga P PPR, PAPR, which is the positive uh, airway pressure for intubation, but they're again cumbersome. And then we have trauma teams, pulmonology teams. But the bottom line is everyone, day or night, knows what they should be doing. So everyone knows which side of the road they need to drive on. We therefore have an intubation team. The intubation team roves around the hospital. As I said, it's anesthesiologist based. It's joint with anesthesiology and trauma surgeon in all the trauma areas. It's joint with anesthesiology and pulmonology in every other areas. Intubations are done with the CMAC, but over and above that, they're done under plastic the team are expected to have an N95 plus the overmask plus a visor. Now, whether you're using uh, a visor that hangs from your head, there are some outstanding surgical masks um, which have got the visor bonded into the mask itself and are less likely to fog up and be claustrophobic and heavy. All patients get a PCR on admission. 
all resuscitation patients, if they are severely injured in any way, get a baseline thromboelastogram because as most people know now, um, COVID patients become hypercoagulable. So if you see that early on, it's just a warning sign. Besides the PCR, they get the routine bloods. And the nature of what we do in trauma is that all our patients get blood alcohol and drug screens. Our normal patients, and it bears the Stellenbosch and uh, other, and other centers, 60% of our patients are over the legal alcohol limit or were. That dropped down during the full lockdown to virtually nil, and the number of admissions dropped from 70 to 80 recesses down to 30 for April and May. As, as things got busy in June, we ended up with something like 80 patients in June, and I believe Baraguanath got its first drunk patient at lunchtime on the 1st of June. All circuit ventilation, all circuits are closed, closed circuit ventilation. So we don't use wall pap at all, no wall CPAP. In fact, we've got around it a little bit because what you're looking for is to try and avoid virus particles in exhaled air, obviously from ourselves, but much more important in the region of the patient. And in a sense, a ventilator is the most sensible way of doing it. But what we don't want is patients exhaling using wall CPAP um, close by everybody else. The other site is any thoracic work and that includes chest drains. So many of you will be familiar with the standard chest drain that you see on the right, the left of this picture. And all we've done is put in a HIPAA filter onto the right hand side and now whatever nasties are in that bottle stay in the bottle. It's a very useful piece of kit because you can also attach it to the expiratory circuit if you're using wall CPAP or something like that, so that no virus particles enter the air from exhaled um, gases, be they exhaled through a chest tube or exhaled through any other form of tube. Which is more important, asked Big Panda, the journey or the destination? And the answer is neither. We know where we're going. We know our destination. The most important of all is the company that you keep. This virus is still active. Are we the vectors, not the charts? Are we the next host? Staff support is incredibly important. Team counseling. We have full-time trauma counselors who carry a recess page. Some of them are dominiers or uh, have religious backgrounds, others have psychological backgrounds. We do a lot of trauma team building. One of the things that we've introduced is free net internet for patients and staff. And the benefits of that obviously is there's a dedicated tablet in every ICU, in every red zone, because as you well know, its visitors are the biggest hazard, both in vectoring and in taking bugs back and taking it out. We have Zoom teaching in pulmonology. We have Zoom teaching. Many of you may have uh, tuned in last Thursday and the second Thursday of every month. There is a major trauma zine, uh, Zoom program. But I think you have to make the staff feel responsible for each other's welfare. Uh, so those of you who know me, one of the the phrases that I like is those of you who eat bacon and egg, think of the two terms, involved and committed. We are all involved in the treatment of COVID patients. How many of us are committed to each other? Because if you think about it, the chicken is involved and the pig is committed. So part of this talk is really a salute to healthcare staff and a challenge to those of you outside. If we can do this as healthcare staff, so can Shout you. Shout out to all the frontline staff, and we would like this to challenge all morning. the level one trauma centers.
to all the listeners tonight, thank you for listening. I've left time because I have no doubt that there are a number of people with specific questions and rather try and answer too many of them. I'm open for whatever questions in your situation. Not everybody is as fortunate as we are with our resources, but all of us are unfortunate enough to have to deal with this disease and will have to deal with this disease, both in patients who are sick from the disease and the reality is those who are well are being seen for other diseases and unfortunately do both. Good. Thanks so much, Prof. I've um, lost, I've lost uh, my screen, but as long as you can hear me, um, we, can, we, we had a load, we had a load shared, I think. Okay, we, we can still see your, your presentation and, and we can still see you. Ah, oh, I'm back. Uh, right. Just as a reminder, you can either raise your hand or we'll type a question on the side. There is one question that's already come up uh, and it's uh, from Johan uh, who has said, are we not inviting problems by calling wards green? Staff and doctors seem to drop their vigilance. I think that is absolutely right. And it depends to some extent on um, the areas and everything else. So that a doctor's consulting rooms, for example, where there is very tightly controlled hand washing, separation and appropriate masking is probably a green zone. It's probably less dangerous than your supermarket. Uh, if there's any doubt, err on the side. It's a cost thing as well. The more um, uh, the more PPE you put in place, the more it costs, the more you end up not having it when you need it. And that's not local to South Africa. Despite everything that you've seen here, we ain't anything compared to what they have to put up with in, uh, in Europe, never mind in developing countries. Um, three people sharing the same ventilator, which was set to the tidal volume of 1500 across three ventilator circuits, taking clothes home to wash them every night. Yes, it happens here, but it's not just here. So there are green zones, but err on the side of every patient is a PUI, the jogger next to you, the person in the supermarket, the person in the emergency department, the person at school. However, the people at school, the people in hospitals, hopefully we're better controlled. Perfect, thanks, Prof. Um, there's a few other, uh, maybe actually just before we go to other questions, man, I think this is a topic that we've discussed a few times in terms of labor wars, green areas and green zones. But maybe some thoughts on how we've adapted our strategy within net care, just to try and tackle this, uh, this perception. Yeah, thank you, um, Chris, and uh, thanks, Prof, for a great talk. I think um, we've been managing um, highly uh, infectious pathogens at NetCare for a long time, and the understanding of the green, yellow, and red zones is, is understood by a majority of staff. And I agree with Prof Boffard. It doesn't matter which zone you're in. If you drop your guard, you're going to get COVID. And so the most important thing we found on the, um, on the uh, exposures is that hand washing and uh, sharing a taxi and, uh, and eating together and sharing your food are opportuni opportunistic spreading mechanisms. And so just maintaining your guard all the time. Uh, we currently are sitting with a majority of yellow and red zones, which is uh, PUI and COVID positive. I think we'll be moving into a strategy which, uh, which I envisage is a respiratory and non-respiratory type hospital with a COVID positive side and a potentially non-COVID positive. But uh, that's really um, the strategy. The other thing I just want to cover is we don't subscribe to any double masking at all. We have numerous incidents of double masking where uh, persons have become uh, positive because they misunderstand the system and they put the surgical mask underneath the uh, N95 mask and they have no fit. And so we say that if you wear your mask and your visor at all times, there's absolutely no reason and should be discouraged um, on double masking. If that answers the other question. Sorry, Prof, I had to get that in very quickly uh, before we have the whole country double masking again. Absolutely. It's, 
if you think about it, if you look at when you walk into a, uh, an organization, it's got people lined up on the counter. They do have a mask on. Where are the gaps? They're on the side, pointed right at their next uh, colleague. So the most important thing with a mask is a properly fitting mask, no matter what mask you wear. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Prof, uh, there was another question. Do you think we're going to get a spike in two weeks after moving to level two? That's from Riaz Mohammed. And Klaus, I'll take your question now. Sorry. I, th I think that the, the reality is it's possible. And it depends on how the South African public responds. I think there is no doubt that the shutdown the second time, middle of June, with a reinstitution of a curfew and reinstitution of the alcohol ban had a major role to play. My personal view, it was probably the curfew that made a, a bigger impression. But I think at this stage, f people are finally getting it. I don't know that we're going to get that much of a spike, one hopes not. If we separate, mask, um, and an N95 mask in a yellow area, I think we'll be okay. Chris, do you want to take the questions? I know there's one from Klaus that says, how is recovery determined in the, and I would like you to talk from the trauma perspective as well, Prof. Well, we, we adhere to both the national guidelines and um, to the, the net care guidelines, but essentially COVID recovery is, is now defined as, as 10 days from onset of disease. Uh, Mandy, the net care policy differs at all from that? Uh, so, um, n no, but it differs. In, in fact, the DOH and NICD says from clinical stability. So the minute the patient is off oxygen and becomes clinically stable, it's 10 days from clinical stability. So it can push some patients into four weeks because they might be in ICU ventilated. Then when they become clinically stable, 10 days from then. But yes, the 10 day rule uh, generally applies. I, I see a few questions here about N95s and the use of masks on the ward. The, the first question is just say, should uh, N95s be used in a PUI zone? And I think uh, I'll just maybe talk to the net care policy and how we've approached it in terms of using N95s in PUIs. I think the key is that uh, depends on what sort of activities like risk mitigation and not necessarily uh, about what patients you have around you. I think the risk mitigation strategy that we've employed is that if you're doing an aerosol generating procedure, then in that setting, you would use an N95 mask. Uh, whereas if you are doing an aerosol generating procedure and you're in a in our yellow or our green zones, our PUI zones, uh, you wouldn't justify wearing an N95. But in our red zones, we do recommend wearing an N95, just given, N95 just given the, the setting that you're in. Um, and I think there's also been a response here from, from Eva to say, I think physio should wear N95s or equivalents in, in all zones. I think that's more just to talk to the fact that a lot of the procedures done by physios are often aerosol generating procedures, given as chest physio and things like that. Uh, and that's really just a more of a safety aspect in that concern and, and mitigating that risk. Manu, just, to, add? just to add to that, I mean, I, our physios, uh, we've, we deem as amongst the highest at risk because obviously they, by definition, making their patient breathe hard. Um, and an N95 very, very early on. A word of caution, there are N95s and N95s and people buy, it's got the magic letters and so on on it. But N95s are designed to stop inhaled particles and that's fine. But many of the ones that come for industrial use have no exhale protection. They're designed to stop dust getting into your lungs, but they don't have any effect on getting your bugs out. They go straight out of the exit port. And I think financially, the amount of N95s, if it's too, che if it, if it's too cheap to believe, it's probably a good reason for that. Yes. So there was a question about patients wearing masks from Johan van Willeg again. Johan, patients, it is a legal requirement for everyone in South Africa to wear a mask, whether that be a cloth mask, a surgical mask, or an N95, depending on the area you're in. So if a patient wear a mask, even under nasal cannula, uh, or the nasal cannula under the mask, then patients should wear masks and the nurses should be concentrating on that. And I'm sure if you 
uh, bring that to the attention of management where there are patients that are not wearing masks. Remember, patients also spread to patients. It's not really about the staff. They've got PPE on, but it's about patients spreading to other patients as well. Uh, yeah, aerosolizing procedure, neck cases, wear a, a N95 mask. Uh, we, FFPs are the same, the FFP2 as the N95. You can't get the standard N95 that we used to, uh, which is the duck build one. So whatever masks neck care supplying um, are, have been approved and are vetted. So if you're getting it in the hospital, you're getting a proper mask. Uh, we have been using full face snorkel masks. Absolutely wonderful. Prof, have you seen them? We're no longer swimming above. We are all treading water on top of the sea. <laughs> Comes down to cost as always. Yeah, and then this is fomite transmission aggregated, uh, exaggerated. I don't think it's exaggerated, but the lack of hand washing is definitely not la exaggerated. I think in, amidst all of this, you will see such poor hand hygiene from healthcare professionals. It's actually quite sad. So, you know, they don't understand that if you're wearing a pair of gloves, doesn't stop that bug from jumping on the glove and traveling with you to the patient. There is no shortcut to hand washing, nothing whatsoever. And I think that even if you don't wear gloves, you're safe. But if you don't wash your hands between it, that's how FOMATs are spread. Certainly not from me leaning on a table that Prof Boffard leaned on two minutes before and picking it up via my elbow. It's pure hand hygiene. And if you can look at the level of, of other bugs that are transmitted by the hand, they haven't dropped which means we still have a hand hygiene problem. Prof, do you disagree? You, the big, you were the first one at Mill Park Trauma to put a policeman at the door because of hand hygiene. I don't know how you yeah. feel. Uh, yes, we, we've, we've reintroduced the death penalty if you don't take everything off below your elbows. We do have a policeman at the door and we have the lowest sepsis rate of any ICU around simply because of the consciousness of it. it wasn't from COVID. It was from the fomites of acinetobacters and equivalent, which were transmitted between charts or transmitted by people who leant on the roof of their car, walked into the ICU, did lip service to washing their hands and forgot about all the bits they were leaning on and passed it on that way. I can't agree more than 150%, uh, Mandy. And then how risky is high-flow nasal oxygen with regards to aerosolizing? personal view is that a high flow nasal oxygen has an effective place. It increases the risk, but if you've taken the proper precautions against inhalation and um, then the benefits exceed the risks, but as with everything else, it's a risk benefit ratio. So Prof, I've got one question of my own, which I haven't typed, if you don't mind. We all know that uh, corticosteroids and trauma don't go well. Uh, anticoagulation and some of our trauma cases don't do well either. How are we managing that polytrauma patient who has already uh, got a clotting problem, has been cold, has a storm, doesn't like uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the medication that's currently brilliant for, for COVID? How are we balancing that act with our polytraumas or our burns? I think that the first thing that you've got to do as with everything else, is prioritize the disease. While the patient's primary problem is their trauma, and that's usually with multi-trauma in the first few days, they have got to be treated with a comorbidity of trauma, not the other way around. There's very little, as you say, place for, for steroids in trauma. There is no doubt that early steroids in trauma increase the uh, mortality <clears throat> and morbidity rate and so we discourage them. It's been shown that if you become symptomatic from COVID, then there is some benefit. And the advantage of a team is that the pulmonologist and the trauma surgeon, and all trauma surgeons are critical care specialists as well, can have a one-on-one -on -one discussion on priorities and decided is the risk of steroids exceeded by the risk of the COVID. Steroids should probably be restricted to in-hospital use only and in patients who have some respiratory compromise. With regard to coagulation, trauma patients become hypercoagulable very early on unless they are bleeding and then 
obviously controlling of the bleeding is key. Usually by the time they're sick from the COVID, they're past that state. We're fortunate we have the gold standard, which is thromboelastography. INR is notoriously unreliable. Normal clotting measures are notoriously unreliable for abrinogens and prothrombin times and everything else. But if you can get a point of care or early uh, thromboelastogram, I upset staff because it's like saying it's the old style mother-in-law baking a cake. You ask her, how come her cake's so good? And she says, I taste it. I look at it. I see if the yeast is making it rise. And the thromboelastogram is a dynamic way of looking how the clot is forming, looking where patients are hypercoagulable and shouldn't be, and should be anticoagulated with something that can be reversed easily, and patients who are coagulopathic, what are they missing? Are they missing platelets? Are they missing fibrinogen? So the thromboelastogram has allowed us to do what's called goal-directed hemostasis. And I, I don't think there's any longer a, a compromise. I think we're all on the same page of being able to maintain uh, the correct balance. What is quite clear is that COVID patients become very resistant to normal heparin and so on. The doses of clexane or equivalent are hopelessly inadequate in a COVID patient. And thromboelastography is the only way in which you can balance that safely. Thank you. Um, I've been wanting to ask you that for weeks. I'm glad I asked you today. Um, are, are there any other trauma questions for Prof? Doesn't look like it, Ken. Yeah, Chris, anything? Nothing. Nothing from my side, Mandy. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very much, Prof. Thanks I, for the privilege of being part of it and this entire weekly initiative. It's magic. Those of you who want to tune in to the next trauma discussion, it's on the 10th of September, and uh, Mandy or the trauma team will pass, pass that on. We will do, definitely. Tomorrow night, Prof, if you want to join us, is uh, Audrey Cook on the post-COVID patient. So uh, those of you who are still on, don't forget to join us and register for tomorrow evening. And then right. uh, at the end of the month, we've got some really good ones as well. Mandy, that's Wednesday evening, not tomorrow, eh? Wednesday evening, yes, Chris. You know I can't get my Mondays and Wednesdays right. No, no treatment no. for that. No, absolutely not. Thank you very much, uh, Chris and Prof. Good evening. Pleasure. Good evening. Thanks, everybody.